A former chemical engineer and investment banker, he is the founder of Vista Equity Partners. In 2018, with a net worth of $5 billion, he became the wealthiest African American in the world, surpassing Oprah Winfrey. He recently decided to pay off the entire student loan debt of the 2019 Morehouse College graduating class of 396 students. He's Robert F. Smith, and here's my take on his Top 10 Rules of Success, Volume 2. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one, wanted badly enough. When I was coming through, I had a great group of classmates and they were actually introducing computers for the first time. And so my computer instructor was telling me about, I was asking, well, how does this actually work? And was telling me about the transistor and, you know, it was developed at this place called Bell Labs. And I found out there was one in Colorado, so uh, Denver Bell Labs. And I called them, I said, I'd love to get an internship. Uh, do you have them? They said, yes, if you're between your junior and senior year in college. I said, well, that's great. I'm a junior in high school taking AP classes, just like being in college. And they said, well, no, it isn't. Uh, and I said, well, you know, I'd love an internship. And so I called every day for two weeks. They stopped taking the call after the second day. And I called every Monday for about five months. And one day they called back and said a student from MIT didn't show up. We have an extra slot. And if you'd be interested, we're not guaranteeing your job, you can come and interview. Because remember, they'd never met me. So I put on the one suit that I owned and put $2 in my, of gas in my car and drove out there and got the job and basically worked there for the next almost three and a half, four years uh, as an intern while I matriculated with my degree at, uh, at Cornell. I think they appreciated the fact that I really wanted that job. And I really wanted to you know, better myself. Rule number two, create an environment of innovation. You have to be thoughtful about creating an environment where, where new ideas of innovation are not only welcome, but they're encouraged, they're embraced, and the success of them are, are trumpeted. Sure. Because otherwise, you, you, you have the risk of, like all things, you know, the complacency factor you know, leads, you, leads you down a narrowing road of opportunity. And look, I face it with my own firm now, 18 years, you know, 17 going on 18 years in, in the making, of how do we make sure we don't atrophy on what we were good at? And oh, by the way, how do we ensure that we continue to, to evolve our culture on the one hand and, 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 and expand our business opportunities in the markets that we're in? Rule number three, take risks. You're okay. doing very well out there. You're now mm -hmm. living in San Francisco area. You're making a big success. You're by investment banking standards. I presume you're you know, highly compensated and so mm -hmm. forth. What propelled you to say, I'm going to give all this up and go start my own company? <laughs> right. So the interesting thing that occurred, as you know, again, as an engineer, the th I realized way back in my Goodyear and Tire and Rubber days, the impact that software really had on businesses. The thing that I noticed that there's very few software companies were actually efficiently run. Well, why? Um, the big part was most executives who started software companies, well, they wrote code or they knew a market opportunity and they sold the code. There was never anyone who taught them how to run software companies. So I then run into this, this small company, I'll say small, in, in Houston, Texas, that is the most efficient software company I've ever seen. They had some very basic things that they just did extremely well. And I said, wow, if you took those basic things and, and actually applied them ultimately to other enterprise software companies, you could run those businesses very similar to the way they ran theirs and would create tremendous value in those companies. Right. That, that was the idea, that was the conceit. And they said, that's a good idea, why don't you do it? Well, yeah, in essence. They said, well, if you actually thought about taking some of these best practices and putting them, buying enterprise software companies and driving them forward, you could actually do pretty well. And I said, that's a great idea, would you do that? And I said, well, you know, and they gave me one of those offers that looked quite interesting. And I remember my lawyer said, this is a bad deal, Robert, but you should take it. <laughs> right. So you went to Goldman and said, I'm leaving. And right. Did they try to talk you out of it? I of course. They did. Of course. They made the pitch against it. But, you know, I, like all things, David, you, at some point in time in your life, you know, you've got to look yourself in the mirror and say, you know, you, you have to take a little risk and go see if this is something How old were you work. when you took this? I was 39 years old. Okay. And it's, oh, it's so interesting. So, of course, I started doing research. It was the same age that others right. left what they were doing to go start their businesses. So I said, well, let's go give it a run. Rule number four, be purposeful. How do you make sure you make a change in the world, in your community, leveraging your profession? You know, if you're an engineer, there are certain things you can do. If you're a teacher, there are other things you can do and different things you can do. And I think it's important uh, that I say, you know, you, you, you pick, a, pick a cause and have an effect as opposed to meander without direction and just kind of glance through different sets of economic opportunities, but pick, pick a cause and make an effect. So be purposeful, that's what I really want the message to be. 
Also, if you want to learn from other leaders in the black community, check out my 254 Black Excellence program. It's free. The link to join is in the description below. You can actually make more money being smart than you can being strong or fast. Running your own race demands trusting yourself even when others don't. Rule number five, create a peer network. It is important to have certain philosophies in managing your business. Um, there's a couple that I use. I'm going to focus on one here. One is I call the principle of self-replication, right? Because you all will pretend that, oh, I'm the best representative of every person in my company and they should act just like I would act. There's a problem with that, okay? Um, because you actually aren't the best person in that job because it evolves and all those sort of things. So you actually have to create what I call space and, and volume for people to fill with who they are. Mm. And this is the principle uh, that I call, you know, you need to create a platform where people can become their best selves. Okay, and becoming your best self is not only understanding why we are doing what we're doing, but you have to have room for them to contribute their capabilities into your ecosystem mm. and into that ecosystem where it can now evolve into a better, a, a better solution for the collective. And then you have to have mechanisms by which that naturally occurs. For instance, I have these things called BPSS, Best Practice uh, Sharing Summits. Every month, somewhere on the planet, our top 300, 400 executives by function are getting together. Mm -hmm. Okay, for two or three days. Mm -hmm. And it might be sales, marketing, GNA, whatever it might be. And in those two or three days, you know, of 50 portfolio companies, there'll be, you know, 400 people in sales, you know, regional sales reps, you know, national sales rep, et cetera. And they're gonna teach and train each other on these best practices mm. over two and a half and three days. And so those who are doing the teaching, of course, now have the ability to what I call express the refinements and express how they've actually implemented some of these best practices mm. and how they've been effective. Mm. Those in the audience who've just joined the portfolio, we've just bought the company, mm -hmm. okay, now have a chance to participate and see and learn and hopefully it becomes aspirational because it usually does. They say, man, you know, in a year or two or three years, I want to be the one up there teaching mm -hmm. my, my colleagues. And then you create a peer mentoring network. It's very different. Entrepreneurs, as you probably know, as if you're executives, I mean, it's a lonely environment. It's a lonely world. Who do you talk to, right? Well, if you think about it and you're in a company of 200 employees of five and you're running sales and services, well, who is your peer group? Who do you talk to about some question that you have where there's not a conflict? So I like to think that it's we- It's kind of like being Dean. Yeah, it kind of, you're, it's a lonely <laughs> job, right? You know, well, you can go talk to your president. She's, she's lovely and she's wonderful and smart yeah. and helpful, but she's going to conflict you out if, if, if you don't do something the way she wants to do it. Um, but that's an interesting thing, right? You know, and so for you entrepreneurs in this audience, I would also recommend YPO, um, Young Presidents Organization, if you could join that. Uh, and then the more important part of YPO, people tell you the networking and all that, that's nice, but the important part of it is actually your forum. Okay, and forum is where you pick six or eight people or they pick you. They have to be in a business that's non-conflicting. Uh, and then you will always say, oh, I don't have time for this. And you'll find that that's the best time you spent mm -hmm. that month because you can actually now talk about ideas. You, people need to have some peer-to-peer -peer network yeah. and mentoring and you know, engineering school gives you that in, in some respects um, at, at that level. And that's an important part of the refinement ultimately as an entrepreneur and an executive is to create a peer network to engage with. Rule number six, think differently. We are truly in the, the early stages of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, there is a digitization of every single industry on the planet and ultimately that will lead to the digitization of every single company in one way, shape, form, or another. We have these talks about, oh, you know, everybody wants to be a king, right? No, you actually want to be an emperor, okay? And that's what Bezos has done, mm -hmm. if you think about it, because now you can actually, you know, disintermediate entire industries if you have the right platform. The next thing I think about is, you know, what creates, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a chemical engineer, I like to think about the world in states of equilibrium. What is the next state of equilibrium in an industry? So that's the next lens through which I look at an industry. And if you can do that, you're gonna know what's gonna participate in that ecosystem of equilibrium and what is no longer necessary for that ecosystem to remain in equilibrium, mm -hmm. okay? So to a great extent, if you take the insurance business, well, do you need underwriters or do you just need underwriting? Okay, and then you have to ask yourself, well, do you need underwriting or do you actually need to just have some way to manage risk? 
Okay, and then you say, well, on the investment side of the house, do you really need investors to manage that risk or you just need to match assets with the liabilities over dated periods? So think about the equilibrium states. What is gonna be the equilibrium state that, has, that can be achieved leveraging current elements of technology which have now accelerated through true machine learning, true artificial intelligence, and through true cognitive development associated with it. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Let me give you an example. If you are in the automotive business and you are a very large scale automotive company and you make cars or you make trucks, you participate in only one slice of that industry. But the equilibrium of that industry is gonna be supplied by the parts, the, oh, the insurance. Supply chain, the supply chain and the changes. All of it. Massive, yeah. Right, but you can't control that whole ecosystem. So as a, from an opportunity perspective, the way we think about it is how do we become leaders in the ecosystem as opposed to participants in the silos? So that's to give you a sense for where we go and how interesting we- way, Interesting way to think about it. Rule number seven, connect with nature. You're a big fly fisherman. I love it, yes. I now do. tell me what the appeal is because uh, you have a big brain and you're trying to outsmart a fish that has <laughs> a, a little brain. small brain. Yeah. So why is that so complicated? <laughs> it's, it, 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 because those little brains are, are, are actually focused on outsmarting you because you're in their territory. But the beauty of it, honestly, David, is nature. Uh, you're standing, I think about it, you know, all things in, in this world uh, that we live in today depend upon water in order to live. I think about water as being, in essence, the literal lifeblood of this planet. And you're standing in this water with your feet on the soil and the water is rushing around you. And at some point in time, if you open yourself to it, all things become one. Right. And you stand there and you start to realize that you are part of this greater, this greater consciousness right. of existence. And, and this is the fly fishing is just a way to stand in the water without looking ridiculous. Rule number eight, study the market. I think it's critically important to always be aware of you know, the, the competitive dynamic in your market, but not aware of it just in, in, in a point of fear, but in a point of, of education. Mm -hmm. you, you, should, you should make sure you are continuing to inform yourself as to where your market is going. Mm -hmm. And don't be so egotistical to know that you think that you know everything, mm -hmm. but to be open yourself mm -hmm. To, to be getting informed on where your market's going. Rule number nine, get knowledge. I just remember growing up in, call it recent, recently desegregated uh, schools in, in Denver, and uh, you grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood. There was a Japanese family that lived around the corner, um, and I know why they lived there. Uh, if, you, if you think about you know, how, how they were, um, Japanese Americans were, were, were treated during the war, et cetera. Uh, but you know, we had our own grocery stores and own doctors, and I had I lived next to the Lieutenant Governor of mm -hmm. the state who was black, mm -hmm. uh, in two state sen or state senator who was a representative who was black. Uh, but I looked at how we lived, and I said, you know, everyone tells me education is a key, uh, and it wasn't bad. Uh, but I could tell the kids who I went to school with lived a whole lot differently than we did, and none of their parents had PhDs, right? So I said something. There's a gap here, and I wanted to understand what that was. So. That's what led me to actually think about, you know, what is it? It isn't just education, that's a part of it, there's no question. Uh, but it's access to opportunity, access to mentorship, access to know-how, and it gets back into that intellectual property piece. You know, it's knowledge. And mm -hmm. I tell people in America, we have really six exports, all of them are intellectual property based at mm -hmm. the end of the day. It's knowledge and insights and information that if you don't have that, uh, no matter, in some respects, how much capital, how much desire you have, it's gonna be hard for you to move uh, along the, uh, the, 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 the wealth chain and expand the opportunity set for yourself and your family. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip, is give back. Why do you decide to become such an active philanthropist uh, yeah. in just a few years? I saw my mother uh, write a $25 check to the United Negro College Fund every month growing up. And even when I wanted a new pair of you know, Converse All-Stars, uh, she said, go earn the money to get them yourselves. And she wrote that $25 check, which I could have bought two pairs with. Uh, you know, she, she instilled in me the importance of giving to the community. I saw my father, who, who was on the board and ran you know, the, the local YMCA, it was the East Denver YMCA, and you know, how he contributed time and energy and, and intellectual capacity on raising funds so the kids in our neighborhood could go uh, and spend you know, camps or summer 
summer camp and, and enjoy the outdoors and understand the importance of the outdoors and building one's sense of spirit and one's soul. So all through my life uh, growing up, uh, you know, philanthropic endeavors were part of my family, my family dynamic. Now I've got a special bonus tip from Robert on how to seize opportunities that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the three-point landing question. It's time to go from just watching a video to taking action. Here we go. Question number one, how will you give back this week? Number two, what knowledge do you need to invest in yourself? And number three, how can you create a peer network so you're not alone? If you travel the world like I do, uh, and I probably go to you know, 40, 50 countries a year, um, you start to really understand that this is one of the few places where we have on-ramps uh, to opportunity that other places don't. And in some cases, you know, we don't see those on-ramps as prevalent in our communities. And so part of what our role here is, is to force those on-ramps to, uh, to emerge uh, and, and create them when we can and, uh, and, and demand them when they are withheld. And so part of what the elders of this community have to do is make sure that they are never silent in demanding those on-ramps. And part of you as youth have to understand is when those on-ramps become present uh, to take advantage of every step along the way because there has been a lot of blood, sweat, tears, and literal blood um, to put those on-ramps uh, uh, and make them available for you to launch into what is the greatest economic opportunity on the planet, which is in America. If you want more Robert Smith, check out the first top 10 I did on him. The link is right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. You can actually make more money being smart than you can being strong or fast. Running your own race demands trusting yourself even when others don't.